think you got a couple minutes. I'll write in the blue pad. I'll just watch you. Get, you to, I'm sure you can do a real stand for this kind of place. I think I'd like to get a few bucks. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good morning. This is Seth Gallagher with National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Uh, welcome to the webinar. We're going to hang out here for a couple minutes and let uh, some additional folks join in, and we'll get started here in uh, about three to five minutes. I need that. Okay. Why don't you come over here? Whatever is easier for you. Maybe easier for us to not have to do. Doesn't matter. Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining the webinar. This is Seth Gallagher with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We're going to give this another minute or two um, for folks to log in here, and we'll go ahead and kick this off and get started. Thanks for your patience.
see a phone number. That's interesting. All right, well, they... okay. All right, here we go. Okay, hey, good morning. This is Seth Gallagher with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. Thanks for uh, joining us for this morning's webinar on the Northern Great Plains uh, 2017 uh, request for proposals. We'll go ahead and get this kicked off. Um, hopefully, uh, we won't take the full hour, but we, we very well may with some uh, opportunity for questions and answers as we go along. Um, technical difficulties. We're trying to advance the slide here. Here we go. Hopefully folks can see the slides advancing. If you're having difficulty with audio um, or visual, please uh, send us a, a text in the, in the chat dialog box and we'll try to make sure that we get that addressed. So uh, we'll go ahead and kick this off, just a, a, a brief overview um, of kind of what we plan to cover today. Welcome and introduction, some housekeeping on today's webinar, a little bit about uh, NIFWF, and then we'll get a little bit more in-depth on Northern Great Plains uh, program and an overview, and then um, slide into more uh, of the technical end of how actually to put a proposal together and submit it within the NIFWF um, system. Uh, and then we'll go over a uh, timeline, how to get some technical assistance as needed, and then hopefully at the end there, there'll be time for, for questions um, towards the end. If you have questions as we go through here, please don't uh, hesitate to go ahead and just put those in the question uh, box, and we'll probably pause about halfway through as we make the switch from uh, more programmatic issues to uh, to the application process, we'll probably pause there and, and take a couple minutes to answer questions. So as you uh, have questions, don't be shy about typing them in there. and We'll do uh, the best we can getting those addressed here um, as we go along or towards the end of the webinar. Uh, just quick housekeeping. Um, for today's webinar, it sounds pretty good right now, but just please make sure that your telephones are muted to um, keep down the background noise. And again, uh, you can see the question dialog box there uh, as we go here. You can keep keep up with us there. Just real briefly about the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation for folks on the line who may not have worked with us or may not be familiar with us. We are a 501c3 that was uh, chartered by Congress in the early 80s um, with the mission of sustaining, restoring, and enhancing the nation's natural heritage. And we do that by bringing uh, federal agencies and the private sector together and, and creating common ground among um, many diverse interests. And so uh, basically leveraging um, federal dollars with private dollars is what we do. A little bit more on how we how we do that um, is we have federally appropriated dollars and cooperative agreements with federal agencies, and then our non our non federal resources come in um, via corporations, foundations, private donations, and things like mitigations and settlements. And so while we certainly don't wish for bad things to happen when those things do occur, um, things like Deepwater Horizon. Um, funding that comes from from those types of settlements often gets leveraged through the, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation um, where that money comes together and, and we um, then grant it out um, to programs really focused on species, places, and issues that can essentially move the needle for conservation. And as you'll see today, the Northern Great Plains is an example um, of that, those types of programs as we move forward here. I do. I forgot my notes. Uh, today on the line from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, we've got uh, two, two staff members on with us. We've got Kimberly Schreiner, um, our Conservation Programs Coordinator out of our Washington, D.C. office. And then here in Denver um, with me is Chris West, our uh, Rocky Mountain Region um, Director, and then myself, Seth Gallagher. I'm the Program Manager here for the Rocky Mountains. Um, and the point person now on, on Northern Great Plains. So if you have questions program specific, and I'll put my contact up at the end of the presentation, um, I'd be the, the person to get in touch with. 
Okay, so sliding into the Northern Great Plains um, program, uh, this is basically NIFWF's goal is to, to directly maintain and improve a hundred or a million acres rather of interconnected uh, native grasslands within focal areas of the Northern Great Plains, and we'll show those focal areas here in a bit. Um, to sustain healthy populations for grassland obligate species and to sustain livelihoods um, you know in, in an economically sound way throughout the region and so um, really one of the main focuses of this uh, program is keeping the grass green side up we've seen um, a lot of work out there that talks about um, farming and tillage and how, how there's uh, less and less intact large blocks of native grass and, and really the, the gist of, of this program is to maintain uh, those, those large blocks in, in functional grasslands. So uh, the Northern Great Plains, it's, it's been around for a couple years I think as folks know, three or four years now. Um, it's had, uh, NIFWF has had a Northern Great Plains program. We've granted about 33 um, grants to date um, with the most recent round here uh, going out and then uh, our request for proposals now for, for 2017. Um, we have finally put together a Northern Great Plains business plan that was approved by the board in November and so um, there'll be some links in here to our page, our Northern Great Plains page um, and I'd, I'd really encourage folks to go to that website and click the link for the business plan and, and make sure that there's a familiarity with the business plan. That's really sort of the roadmap to the program and, and uh, where, uh, where we talk more in detail about the program priorities. And the program itself is a little bit unique to NIFWF in that it's got species outcomes um, listed as priorities but also uh, really a focus on the landscape and, and habitat in general. And so um, we're looking at things like the conservation of 100,000 acres. And so this is through um, things like conservation easements uh, and, and fee title. Those types of permanent protection is what we consider conservation. Restoration, 150,000 acres over the next 10 years. That's more of your sort of hard practices of things like you know, tree removal or reseeding, um, you know, till, tilled areas or non-native grasses back to, to native prairie, and then also improved management, so things like grazing systems and whatnot over 750,000 acres, all toll moving towards our goal of a million acres within those focal areas. Um, and and we'll, we'll kind of break that down here coming up a little bit more. And again, sort of what the strategies that we're interested in investing in under all, all three of those landscape and habitat priorities is further defined in the business plan. So again, I'd really refer you to, to look back um, at the plan and use that as a roadmap for where we're headed. Um, species outcomes, we've got uh, Sage grouse, uh, as, a, as a priority species, we're looking at 10,000 acres of conservation easement within their priority areas um, over the next 10 years, 200 acres of, of wet meadow restoration and, and some fence marking activities within those sage grouse packs that, that occur in the northern Great Plains. Um, pronghorn, uh, identifying migration corridors, but then also addressing uh, bottlenecks through fence removal. Um, and modification across the landscape. Um, really looking at the suite of grassland birds, so chestnut collared long spur, McCallum's long spur, um, Barrett sparrow, Sprague's pipit, and lark bunting. Um, really monitoring those species, but also trying to figure out how to stabilize those declining trends, so decrease the decline of that suite of, of northern Great Plains um, breeding songbirds. And then a focus on uh, black-footed ferret, which uh, the goal there is three populations of 30 or more breeding pairs uh, of ferret, um, again, in those, in those priority areas. And I should say that this whole, all of these prog uh, priorities in the business plan right now is on a 10-year um, timeline. And so the idea here is to reach these goals over the next 10 years. And as we move through um, the program here, we may, uh, you know, subsequently down, down the road revisit some of our priorities as we start to see sort of how the program is developing and how we're progressing towards each of those goals. Um, we'll, we'll assess that as we move along here. So
So our program partners on this, uh, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service, and the USDA uh, NRCS, Montana and South Dakota um, as well. So those are our, our, our federal partners uh, on the program. And then also uh, Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies and BNSF uh, Railway are our non-federal partners on this. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about this later when we get to the matching requirements and whatnot. But but the funding we do have currently for this program is a mix of both federal and non-federal resources. Uh, this is the focal area. Uh, focal areas is identified within our, our business plan. Um, and so these were really identified looking at uh, grasslands in a landscape context. So where are our largest blocks of contiguous grassland um, in existence? And then what ability do we have to essentially add to those blocks or um, implement strategies that would ensure the future existence of those large intact blocks of grasslands? And so um, this is something really to, to pay attention to um, in the business plan. Um, it's not to say that we wouldn't focus or we wouldn't fund outside of the priority area, but uh, certainly projects that fall within the priority area surface as a much higher priority. Um, there there can be, you know, pro we would look at projects that were both in and out of the priority area, um, and that would uh, be sort of a moderate level of interest. And then if it's completely outside, um, it, may, it may not rank quite as high if it's not within those focal areas. But um, that's just to give some, some sort of further guidance. Uh, of the spots and the places where we think uh, the investment, um, where we could have the highest return on investment over the next 10 years. Again, that's in the business plan, so I'd encourage folks to make sure they're uh, referencing that. Project project metrics, for folks who have uh, had NIFWF grants before, you know that um, through the application process and through the reporting process that there are metrics that, that are identified. In the past, um, the grantee has identified their own metrics. And, and in this program, we're really trying to identify the metrics that are important um, for NIFWF to track. And so each of these uh, priorities that we, A4 mentioned uh, have their own set of project metrics, so things like sage grouse, the number of leks at the project site, if possible, the number of males, you know, lek attendance um, is even better information if we can get it. Um, conservation easements, so this is pretty straightforward, but the number of acres protected in long-term easements or greater than, than 30 years, and so specifying sort of, you know, what, what uh, what measures of protection are identified with each of those acres that are delivered as a result of, of NIFWF um, investments. Um, same with land acquisition. Uh, land restoration is also, uh, you know, numbers of acres restored. Um, let's see. And then also uh, improved management practices is also being tracked um, via acres. And so uh, the other Species-specific things in here, number uh, miles of fence for pronghorn, um, number of ferret sites where they're treating for sylvatic plague, um, and then things like numbers of road crossings improved uh, for pronghorn. So depending on how your projects are designed um, and what, what priorities you're identifying um, and addressing within that project um, will really depend on sort of you know how you dig into into those metrics, and one of the things that we'll, we plan to do with grantees is really provide some further guidance regarding um, how to track acres. And the idea here is that um, we want to try to provide some consistency, particularly in regard to um, habitat tracking um, and improved management. And so. Any, anyone who's done this kind of work, you know that there's different ways to count, um, different practices that you implement. And so one of the things that we hope to do um, in the spring um, is get our NIFWF Northern Great Plains team together and, and come to some decisions on how we count different things and provide that guidance to our grantees so that there's some, some level of consistency among how 
different things are reported. Now we know it's not going to be perfect. We know that um, you know certain scenarios come up in restoration and management where it may be difficult to keep everybody on the same page. But by and large, um, it's things like this diagram where we talk about uh, acres under improved management. If you were to install a stock tank in a pasture um, without a management plan, you know how many acres are you impacting and and some guidance on that versus if you were installing infrastructure like a stock tank um, in a grazing system and you had a management plan on more than just that pasture where that tank was going in, it would be more acres counted towards towards management. So w I, this is a kind of a rabbit hole. We don't want to go down necessarily today, but do know that as grantees come come on board and, and decisions are made regarding um, NIFWIF investments, um, this is some this is a conversation that we would really like to have. With our with grantees about how how these things are being tracked, um, so that we have the best possible um, metrics. I should mention too, just going back to project metrics. Um, you know, we're very interested in moving the needle. In the past, where we've had grantees um, identify their own metrics, basically self-identify the metrics that are associated with their project, that's fine to a degree, um, and we understand that there's a lot of different steps and a lot of different strategies that um, folks can take to, to be successful in their project, but at the end of the day, we really want to know what the habitat um, or the species outcome was. And so things like numbers of landowners visited or numbers of workshops or numbers of pamphlets produced, while we understand the recognize and what well, we understand and recognize the importance of those strategies to these projects, we don't really want those to be the the measuring stick of success. Um, we really want to look at how uh, this funding is being essentially put on the ground and how are we um, either conserving um, or protecting um, or restoring species uh, objectives. So if you have questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, Yeah, what how long ago is that? Okay. Okay, so um that is we it looks like we're having some audio um problems, so we're trying to resolve those as we speak here. Hopefully we're not cutting out too bad. Um but but right there's sort of where we uh we're gonna transition from uh more programmatic discussion to more um, the mechanics of how to apply for a NIFWIF grant. So I guess I would ask that if anybody, it's been OK, better recently. OK. Um, if there are any questions, I guess, uh, regarding the program or the business plan, um, sort of more uh, on that end of things, if folks have those now, it's a good time to ask. We can also do that at the end, too. So we'll, we'll roll along here and see um, if anything else comes in. So our eligible applicants, and this all of this information that we're reviewing right now is on the Northern Great Plains um, web page, either in our tip sheet or in the actual request for proposals. All the links are there. And towards the end of the um, towards the end of the presentation, we'll go ahead and show you those links. And we are recording this uh, webinar, and it will be posted to that web page. And so you can go back through and reference this. The links will also be. Uh, that's not a good thing. So again, apologies. Hopefully get this squared away. Okay, so we're going to move into, uh, again, we're going to kind of move away from the programmatic side of things and then into the more mechanical um, of how to apply for a NIFWIF grant. All of this stuff, again, is on our website through the tip sheet, um, and there is also a help desk, and we'll have the links there. So if you have questions about th any of this kind of stuff, you can either contact me um, or go right to that uh, you probably even better is to probably go right to that help desk um, and they can walk you through the steps of how to get in easy grants if you're not already in that easy grants system. So uh, moving into that, um, eligibility for the grants, uh, let's see, I think we're behind the slide here. So eligible applicants um, include uh, 501c3s, 
any federal, state, or local government municipalities, um, Indian tribes, educational institutions. So uh, pretty a pretty wide array uh, of of folks who are available to to apply for funds. Um, the available uses um, we we talk a, a whole lot more about what you're not allowed to do with the funding than, than what you are. Um, you can be fairly creative um, with how NIFWIF funds are spent, but they cannot be spent on um, advocacy, fundraising, litigation, terrorist activities, um, and, and those sorts of things. So um, they can't be used for, for mitigation, um, permitting, and things of that nature. So. Um, just kind of keep that in mind, and if you if there are questions about eligibility, certainly um, pick up the phone and give a shout. But but we certainly don't want to stifle creativity on on how funds are used as long as they um, don't fall into one of these categories of, of things you shouldn't be utilizing NIFWIF resources for. So our funding availability for this cycle of the Northern Great Plains, and again, this is a 10-year program, and and we hope to have this level or more. Um, as the program uh, evolves um, on an annual basis. And so this year we have a, a two million um, available in funding approximately with the typical grant award range, you know, really being anywhere from 25 to 300,000. Um, you know, it's a pretty broad spectrum in there. You know, we do anticipate eight to 10 grants per year. So, you know, if you do the math on that, you know, and divide that by the, by the two million, kind of gives you an idea of, of roughly what we're looking at. Um, and the grant performance cycle can be one to three years. And certainly, you know, one of the strategies that we're, we're looking at is, you know, potential uh, longer term grants. Um, sometimes in these boots on the ground situations, we recognize, you know, it takes a while to get this thing done, these types of activities done. And uh, it certainly um, can be a whole lot easier to do one larger, longer grant proposal than, than say, um, many smaller uh, grants. And it just kind of streamlines work on both the grantee side and on the NIFWIF end of things. And so, um, we're, you know, we're trying to be strategic and keep, keep those types of uh, issues in mind as well. We do anticipate going to one funding cycle per year, and this is a little different for the Northern Great Plains program. Um, in the past, we've uh, we've done um, two per year, um, and we're trying to trying to cycle away from that again to streamline the process. And so, um, you know, there was a little bit of confusion about when uh, when grants were due, when they were when they were twice a year, and, and whatnot. But we're really trying to move to a fall request for proposals. So basically, you know, trying to announce the program probably in August or September. Um, with a winter due date. And this year, the process has been truncated a little bit based on when we have our board meetings and things of that nature. So if you notice, we're asking uh, this go around, we're skipping the pre-proposal process. So this right now, what is currently open is a request for full proposals, not pre-proposals. And so we again recognize that that's a little more arduous. There's a little bit more budget development that needs to go into a full proposal um, versus a pre-proposal. Um, and the ideas sort of have to be a little bit more fleshed out um, than in a pre-proposal. What we hope to do is we go go back to probably a pre-proposal cycle um, and do that uh, and and give people more time to develop their ideas. But really, we're this year we're trying to rush things along a little bit to get it synced up for next year and then for the subsequent ten years. So that's a little bit why. A little bit of the reasoning and the thought process behind why this thing, you know, was just released, and why it's, you know, why full proposals are due so so quickly on this go around. Um, and again, something that you know, if you have questions or thoughts on that, um, I'm glad to have you know conversations post webinar. Yeah. Um. So uh, the proposals do need to be submitted through our Easy Grants um, system. And so uh, the information that you'll need as a part of the application, obviously, is your contact information, where the information or uh, project project information, 
project location, and so a map. Um, and this can be uh, pretty coarse scale. Um, if you know the counties that you that you're planning to work in, and you maybe don't have specific um, projects where you you know you're going to push dirt, but you don't know the specific spot, but you know the general locations as far as a county. That sort of level information is what is fine for the map. Um, the number of uploads, there'll be a checklist in here about what uploads you need to put in there. The narrative, and then and we'll talk more detail here about the narrative, um, but the narrative is really your opportunity to sell the project, to tell the reviewers you know how this project is going to move the needle for the priorities as identified in the business plan and this is kind of the meat and potatoes of the proposal probably what a lot of folks want to hear more about we'll, and we'll get there here in a second um, uh, the budget obviously we'll talk more about that matching contributions and then permits and approvals um, we probably won't touch too much on that we don't tend to have a lot of issue with that uh, but those, that that's kind of an outline here for what we're moving into as far as for, for preparing proposals. You do need to have an easy grants registration. So um, I would say check with your organization um, or your, your direct team. You know, some of the larger national organizations probably have, um, you know, multiple logins. Um, and, and if you're having trouble getting registered into easy grants, please, um, contact that help desk and so you can see the link there at easygrants at nifwif.org or give them a call and they can help you um, get in there and just because you um, you know if you're in there from a large national organization you'll you may not be able to access every um, grant say that Ducks Unlimited has or the Nature Conservancy if you work for those organizations you'll be identified as a contact on on certain grants you'll be given an easy grants number and then that number is tied to your proposal and so we use that number to access all the information for your proposal um, and so that you'll be basically assigned back to that it, that none of that stuff I it's probably important to let you know that really none of that stuff happens from Denver um, all of that really does happen um, in in DC so you can call me and I'm, I'm glad to help you uh, get connected but it that's all stuff that we have our grant administrators work on out of the DC office and so um, if you do call me just know that I'm a stepping stone to getting you know, the right person who can get us squared away um, to move this down the road so again um, you know to go in uh, don't create duplicate accounts um, if you want to go in and see if your organization's in there do a very simple search so if you are with Ducks Unlimited type in the word duck and it'll show you everything in the system that has uh, the word duck in it and then you can select your you know your organization from there and then it has has a lot of the information that that we need uh, Dunn's numbers etc things like that in there um, and then if you need to to be able to access um, easy grants through that organization again we can get you you know get your name registered um, and get you set up so project information you'll be asked to, to um, Name the name the project. We do ask that you don't put Northern Great Plains in the title of the project, just to avoid confusion. So you know, um, skip that and kind of really name your project something more descriptive and specific to the work that you're doing, and avoid you know the terminology Northern Great Plains. What your project start and end dates are, and then the next two are kind of important. A lot of people think they're kind of the same thing, but there's really pretty specific instructions on our descriptions and our abstracts and what information should be included in each of those and so your your character or word limited I think in each of them but we we really do use these um, for very specific purposes things like congressional notifications and and whatnot so um, it may seem uh, it may seem sort of funny that we ask things the way we do but it, I can assure you that there's a purpose there's sort of a method behind all the madness and so just really following the instructions for these and um, getting as much information um, as possible within the abstract and the description as as you're instructed um, in the process is, is pretty important for us so just pay just make sure to pay attention to those so the narrative, um, I've got two slides here to kind of talk about the narrative. It's the narrative as you go in. It's uh, basically a couple-page template. What is it for? Is that? 
six pages. You're limited to six pages. Um, and basically, what you see on the screen right now, activities, outcomes, tracking metrics, and the project team and other are, are basically kind of the sideboards that we give folks regarding the narrative. And so there's a lot of room um, to, to move forward under, under all of those things. And so obviously, um, a little bit more specifics, kind of a little bit more of the, the meat and potatoes about what a narrative should look like. Um, we've, we've put together the elements of a competitive proposal. And so really, your opportunity as a grantee to address these elements of a competitive proposal mostly come uh, in the narrative. Um, and so how does what you're doing fit with the program goals and priorities, again, tied back to that business plan? What's the technical merit? In other words, you know, is it the most current restoration or the most current science, you know, available that's guiding guiding the effort? Um, this probably isn't identified quite as much in the narrative, but also is looked at just as much as the narrative is the budget. We have some separate slides where we'll talk about that, but you know, is what you are asking for a request reasonable in regard to sort of the outcomes? Um, that are that are uh, being articulated, and so again, maybe not as much of that in the in the narrative, but there may be some um, that you could roll into that, and some further explanation that you can provide in the narrative if you feel it's needed. Partnerships, again, if you go back to the NIFWIF mission, the whole idea of collaboration and the idea of the public-private partnerships is really key and important to the things that we do. And so, how how are you? You know, how are you doing that at, uh, on the ground level with uh, uh, as a grantee? Transferability. So, you know, is this is this could this project be a model for others, and could it be replicated across the landscape and multiplied and and further move the needle for whatever the priority is that you're that you're um, you know identified in your in your project? Communication. Who are your key audiences? And what are you communicating? So this gets a little bit at you know what I talked about earlier with our metrics, you know, being things like landowner visits or production of pamphlets or brochures. We want to know if those are activities within the project. Those are important strategies to to help a grantee get to to their end goal. Um, what's your plan for communicating those things, or what are your strategies for communicating those things, and who are you communicating them with? Um, Uh, funding need. So obviously, you know, this is, you know, why is there an urgency behind it? Um, if there is, articulating that urgency, but then also, um, you know, again, just articulating that funding need. And and I should mention too, the cocktail of funds essentially that we have being private and non-private uh, or federal dollars. Uh, any nexus that you have or your project has with federal agencies is also very important to articulate. So that may be identified um, in partnership or in the funding need, um, but anytime you're working with BLM or Forest Service or the Fish and Wildlife Service, what, what are the crossovers with those agencies and the um, opportunities to collaborate on the ground? Um, putting that in the narrative is, is important. Conservation plan and context. So, you know, um, the f this program we're really interested again in moving the needle. And so, we recognize the importance of conservation plans, um, but there's a lot of those out there. And so, how does this how does this work that's being proposed fit with existing plans? Um, and how are you utilizing that so that we know, um, you know, again, a lot of that good planning that's been done is being utilized, and and how how is this effort um, really being referenced back to that? Monitoring while we don't, um, you know, while we can fund some. Uh, some monitoring efforts within projects, you know, um, it really isn't again the focus of of where we want to be with the funding. And so, how how do you plan to monitor those metrics that that have been identified? Um, and you know, what's the plan for essentially gathering that data and reporting out on it? Uh, long term sustainability, again, how how does this? Uh, you know, if 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 a project is a two to three year period, is there a funding plan? in the future to maintain uh, whatever the project is, or is it a short-term kind of 
uh, two years and done. You know, we need this funding for two years, and then we're you know we're on to something else. What you know what what does that look like? What's the long term strategy for the uh, project look like? And then the I've highlighted past success because I think that this one is really important to articulate, particularly if there has been a previous NIFWF investment in the project. Um, we'll have multiple eyes on these grants, not just NIFWF, but we'll also have some external reviewers looking at these that maybe don't have access to the NIFWF system and the reports that are submitted for maybe a phase one of a phase two project. And so in the narrative, if you do have NIFWF funding, I think it's really important to say, you know, this project has been supported through NIFWF in the past. Um, here's what we said we were going to do. Uh, and we've either done it or we haven't done it, and here's the reason was why. So, you know, trying to do that in a concise fashion so that uh, a reviewer who maybe, again, doesn't have access to the reports of phase one um, can really have a good understanding of where this project has been and where it's going. Um, and so I think, you know, I highlighted that one because, again, we're going to have those external reviews. We're going to have some other partner eyes, you know, on these proposals to provide feedback on what makes a strong project and a good project. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't really emphasize the need to uh, articulate that. Uh, and then the final thing is key personnel. And so really talking about who's going to work on the project and what their role is going to be. This has some ties with the budget. Um, you know, uh, we'll get into the budget here in a minute, but it'll talk about not lumping salaries together. Each person who works on the project will have, um, you know, a line item for salary. And, you know, if we are reading in the narrative and, you know, there's a line item in the budget, but it doesn't really address what that person's role is in the project, but yet there's funding outlined for them, that could raise some questions. And so really being clear on um, who those folks are that are working on the project and, and what their role is, um, is also pretty important. So here's the budget. Um, again, this needs to be compliant with OMB, uh, the uniform guidance that came out a year or two ago. Um, so most organizations, I think, are, are pretty in tune with making sure what they're doing is in guidance with that. Um, the, the budget that we're requesting is only the grant amount that you're requesting from NIFWF. And so this can be confusing at times. Uh, at the beginning of your proposal, we'll ask, you know, basically the requested amount and then the match amount and then the total project amount, which is your match plus your project. Uh, but in the budget, we're really just looking at the requested dollars. We're not looking at, you know, your matching dollars and whatnot. So, so keep that in mind um, as you're developing these. Itemized cost is appropriate. Um, again, no lumping costs. Like I mentioned, salaries. You can't just say all salaries, $100,000, and not sort of line item out each of those individual positions and what, you know, what each of uh, what that looks like as far as allocation of resources to those positions. We need that we need that broken out. I would say that lumping, you know, sort of this lumping and splitting, um, you know, I would also encourage you, you know, things like supplies, it's okay to say supplies and give an amount. You don't necessarily have to break it out by um, a roll of tape and a pair of scissors and that and that sort of level of detail. Um, so if you have questions about that again, uh, give us a shout. Um, and total amount requested in project information section should equal the budget grand total. So as I was mentioning earlier, we ask you what your total amount requested is. Your budget grand total and the total amount requested should be the same number. Matching requirements, we get a lot of questions on this. Uh, minimum of one-to-one -one match in the form of cash or in-kind contributions. Um, competitive grants will have a non-federal match component. Um, and federal funds will be considered as match. As you saw from our partner slide, again, we do have that mix of federal, non-federal funds. And so ideally, as we see projects come in, come in, you know, I've kind of been telling folks a good rule of thumb is 50% federal match, 50% non-federal match. Um, you know, we we do have some sideboards on our, on our funding. And so, um, you know, if, if you were to come in with a project that had only federal match, 
um, that's probably something you'd want to make a phone call about before moving move, moving forward because we there's things we can fund and things that we can't fund with certain pots of money, um, and so um, communicating with us is a good thing on that end. But by and large, typical projects, um, some mix of federal and non-federal match um, is is probably the most competitive and attractive route um, to go. Anything else on that? Yeah, all non-fed matches, great. Non-federal match is a very good thing. So, um, Easy Grant uploads, as I mentioned earlier, uh, part of the process here is that there is a list of things that you need to upload, uh, things like your most current audit, your 990, um, the your most current list of board of directors um, or trustees. This is all on the website, and there's a really good web page that actually talks about the definition of these. It also tells you, depending on what status you are, if you're a government agency or if you're a nonprofit, there's a little table um, on the web page that tells you which of these uploads uh, is important for you to make sure that you include. And so I would encourage folks, um, this is kind of a checklist, right, of the uploads that you need. But I would encourage folks to go to that link right there, which is the um, required financial documents. And it really does a great job in stepping you through which forms you need uploaded if you're by, by what sort of organization um, type you are. Obviously, the most current information there is critical. Um, So uh, for further application assistance, all the stuff that we just talked about um, is there. I, uh, the top link there is the, the link to the Northern Great Plains page. Um, and on that page, there's a link to the RFP and a link to the, to the tip sheet. Those are also right here in the slideshow. So if you do come back to the recorded version of the slideshow, you can click. Um, and that tip sheet and the RFP should really give you pretty explicit instructions as far as what needs to occur. Uh, I would say that I, you know, I, I think um, we get a lot of feedback and a lot of comments that the, you know, this process at times seems arduous and, and a lot, but at the end of the day, I think it makes for much better proposals and, and that this organization is really good at, um, you know, getting resources out and on the ground. And so I, while I know it seems arduous, we're here to help you through that process, and there's a reason and, a, again, a method for, for all of the things that we ask and why we ask them. Um, so uh, again, call uh, either here to the Rocky Mountain office or DC if you have uh, application questions, um, and hopefully those links are informative to you through the process. A little bit about our timeline. The full proposals are due uh, December 15th by uh, 9.59 p.m. Mountain Time, so keep that in mind. Um, the review period will be basically December um, and January, and then we'll, uh, during February we kind of get our uh, ducks in a row for our board and a presentation to the board of, of the proposals, and we have a board meeting in early March, and that's when um, the board signs off on on the grant decisions, and then we hope to have agreements in place April, May of next year. And again, that's kind of why we're going to this uh, timing cycle, um, is that we, you know, we realize that in the Northern Great Plains we're limited by weather when we can do things, and so hopefully having agreements signed off on um, in that early spring period allows folks to get a, you know, a full field season in on on whatever their projects are doing. Um, so we hope to keep we hope to keep in that cycle. So our next proposal for 2018 funding we would hope would come out like in August or September um, of 2017 for 2018 funding. And that's it. Thanks uh, for your patience. And we'll uh, we'll go ahead and I think we have some questions. Um, that came through, so we'll go ahead and try to get those addressed. If you have additional questions, keep them coming in, um, and we will 
Let me see if I can expand this. Uh, we'll do our best here to get those answered. Hang on just a second with us. Thanks for your patience. Hey, Seth, this is Kimberly. I have the questions panel opened up. And there okay. is a question that states, why are the metrics listed in the RFP different from the program metrics, Table 3, listed in the business plan? Hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they should match up. Kimberly, we had this conversation yesterday, actually. Um, and the way we have, uh, well, the, the, the quick answer is we need to look into it. If they are not aligning, um, they should be. And so we need to look into that. Let's see. Kimberly, were there other ones? I can't open my window here. I can only see them like a line at a time. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's. I'm seeing the question now about the more the business plan being more specific than. The more specific outcomes in the metrics than what we have printed in the business plan, or the RFP rather. Um, the RFP, the table in the RFP was produced based on how we're, what our ability is to report in easy grants. Um, and so we have this, uh, what's it called? The, we have a system that talks to easy grants about where our, um, our scorecard. So as, um, grantees report on outcomes, they go into a scorecard and basically we have uh, some sideboards on how those metrics can be reported. And so the metrics that are report the metrics that are proposed in the RFP are more aligned with how they would be reported in the scorecard. I don't know if that makes any ter any sense external of NIFWIF and apologies for, um, for the confusion, but basically how they're how they're written in the RFP um, is is more in tune or more aligned with how we'll be entering those into the Easy Grant slash scorecard system internally. Yeah, but the business plan is the guiding document. I mean, the specificity in the metrics table are is really what we're shooting for, even though it's essentially watered down a little bit in the RFP. Does that make sense? Thank you. I see one that says thank you. I must, we must answer it. Yep. Okay. If there are no other questions, um, we'll. There, there is, Seth. There is a okay. new question. Is there okay. a period of allowance for match? Can old match be used if within the last year on the same project? On the yes. So the so the my understanding of the match is that it can be used six months or a year? Six months or a year back from the date of the signed agreement. So if we're looking at, uh, you know, like say if for this go around, we're looking at a May 1st uh, signature date, just as a guess, um, you could backdate to May 1st of 2016. Yeah, a year from the sign. It's a year from the sign date. Anything else, Kimberly, coming up? Or I am not seeing any additional questions at this time. And that's my contact info. Um, should be seeing that hopefully. So if yeah, you have further questions, I'd be glad to 
but yeah, I'd be glad to field emails, phone calls, whatnot, um, if you have any further questions from the webinar. So thanks for your patience, everyone, and sorry for the technical glitches. Hopefully next time that'll go a little uh, little smoother. Uh, but we look forward to seeing what what folks are putting together and uh, working with you here in the future. All right, thanks everybody.